What's up, happy people? I am so excited. And not because today's topic is called Show Me the Money. I really wanted to do the best Tom Cruise today, but I couldn't. But I just want to tell y'all, not only am I excited because we're talking about the money, but because one of our guest presenters today is like my favorite human being on the planet, like of all time. He is the bestest boss ever and mentor. The Dr. Ray Foxworth, founder and president of Cairo Health USA. Did I mention he's kind of the man? And I'm not just saying that because he pays me to. I'm kidding. <laughs> <You are. laughs> and then we have our good friend, Don Rasmussen. He's here to talk to us about credits and loans and all kinds of fun stuff because he really is going to show us the money. And who in the world or how did we ever survive without a certified tax coach? ever in our lives well we don't have to find out much longer so ladies and gentlemen welcome to the webinar thanks christy i uh, appreciate the uh, the info the checks in the mail um, <laughs> don i want to thank you for uh, taking the time to do this update i know you're on multiple webinars a day and i really appreciate all you guys are doing to try to help our profession uh, and i'll have to give kudos to christy and keith esbell and our marketing team uh, we have thrown an awful lot of uh, information at them in a short period of time, and they've been awesome in helping put together these webinars and getting it out to the profession. And Don, I, you know, little did either of us know when we connected last year that we would be in this situation. And, you know, I'm thankful for what sometimes we think are chance meetings and perhaps they're really by design because yeah. you've certainly been able to, to bring some peace of mind to, to me personally, and, and I, I know it's helping others as well. And docs uh, that are joining us today, I want you to know that the information that we are bringing to you on this webinar series and the others that we've done last week and up this upcoming week, they're due to the fact that I'm in the exact same situation you are. I have 20 something employees between Cairo Health and, and my practices. And, you know, I'll, I'll just tell you, it's stressful. I feel the weight and the burden of not only providing for my family and taking care of us, but I truly feel responsible for the people that I have on payroll. You know, I, I've often heard people say, uh, boy, it must be nice to own your own business. I said, yeah, it really is. Instead of us living from paycheck to paycheck, we live from payroll to payroll. <laughs> and that's what Don's going to help us figure out today is how, how do we, uh, what are the updates from the material he covered last week and what do we need to do, know to get started? You know, this is stressful for all of us. And we have to make a decision to either react to it or to respond to it. And so I congratulate you for being on the call because what you are doing is taking action. You're gathering information and you're going to take some next steps. We will continue to tap into the expertise of those that I've worked with. And basically what I'm doing is I'm finding things that are helping me in my practice get through this. And we're doing our best to share them with, uh, with the profession. That's kind of our, our mantra at Cairo Health. We, we truly try to be the network that works for chiropractic. So, <clears throat> you know, there's a ton of information that's flying at us day by day. My mailboxes, my email boxes slam full. And what I hope to do today is to just kind of lay some basic steps, if you will. Where do you even begin? You hear about 7A, you hear about 7B, you hear about the CARES Act. You know, I, I sat down at my, uh, kitchen island and I had all this stuff spread out and it's like where do I even begin and so I began to kind of synthesize some of this and I hope I've put it in a structure that will kind of give you some first steps and what you need to do first what you need to do second so Christy if you'll pull those slides up we'll get started <clears throat> so this is just kind of the the stair stop stair step process that we need to be thinking about we need to look at, you can go ahead to the, to the next slide, Christy. We need to be looking at things that we can do immediately that don't require us to go outside of our own office and, and make some decisions. You need to consider minimizing some expenses. You know, I have weekly staff meetings and I usually buy lunch for the whole staff. Well, that's a nice to have, but it's not a got to have. We use a linen service to take care of the towels and things and, and gowns in our office. That's a nice to have, but it's not a got to have. So we're beginning to rethink some of those things and those expenses. I will encourage you to get in touch with your lenders. 
I can tell you that American Express, Visa, MasterCard, or most all of them are offering a 60 to 90 day uh, deferral without penalty or without harming your credit. For those of you that still have student loans, I had mine for 20 years and claimed it as a dependent, uh, actually probably 25 years. Uh, we know that there's some, some relief for you if you're involved, if you do have student loans. So make sure that you reach out to those lend, uh, lenders as well. The main thing to do is stay in touch with your creditors. Kind of the next thing you can do before you look at some of the federal resources are what funds do you have access to now? And some of these are, I'm not going to say they're good ideas, but they are, you know, when the, when the wolf's at the door, you have to do what you have to do. So I know most of you have credit cards. You need to see what your advance options are on there. See if they will give you a lower rate if you have to do that. Um, I've looked at my life insurance, the cash value that's built up in that. While I certainly don't want to have to tap into it, what I'm trying to do is to look at what sources of revenue that I have out there or funds just in case. And I don't want to be in the middle of chaos trying to make those decisions. Um, and, and so just look at your life insurance, look at your money market accounts. If you have those, um, look at your home equity. You know, I know that's not something I want to do or really anybody wants to do to stay afloat. But like I said, when the wolf's at the door, we've got to know where those resources are and what our options are. I also read something in Forbes just yesterday about the 401ks. You can tap into those if you have anything left in it after the <laughs> stock market uh, situation we're in. But they're relieving you of some of the penalties if you need to draw that down. And then I will, I will have to say uh, one of my resources is NCMIC and they have kind of a fast, lack, uh, fast track loan program um, that is not necessarily collateralized. They can tell you all the details about that, but you know, those are resources that you could be looking at. The next thing that I've found is the, the paycheck protection program. That's the one they call 7A. To me, that's the most favorable that I've seen so far. Um, you do not have to have exhausted all your, cash on hand or your, your funds to be able to obtain that. And it's probably one of the quicker models uh, or one of the quickest paths to revenue. Then there's the 7B, which is the economic, uh, in economic, give me, give, give me the acronym, Don. Yeah, <laughs> econo economic injury disaster loan. Yeah. I've seen more acronyms in the past few days. I think there's somebody that works for the government that their job is to come up with acronyms. They've done the heck of a job with it. Um, well, that, that particular loan is also uh, directly from the SBA. And according to the National Federation of Independent Businesses, they say that can take three weeks to a month to be able to uh, tap into that. And then the, these are the very steps that I'm going through. And then ultimately, I absolutely am leaning on Don and his company to begin to help look at recouping some funds, some taxes that I've paid previously. But that's more to me, a longer term process, something that I'm going to look at um, I mean, we can certainly, I'm starting to gather the information for that now because, you know, this assistance that we're going to get for a few months from the federal government, it's only going to last so long. And so I want to begin to look at other resources that might be 30, 60, 90 days down the road or a little bit longer, uh, just to help us out in case we're, you know, we're still struggling. So Don, my intention wasn't to, to go into the details of each of those programs since you covered this for a lot of the people on the call. Uh, a week ago. How about if you would hit it at a, at a high level on those because sure. some people are new to this and then provide any updates on those particular uh, loan programs and anything else you have to share with us. Sure. And thank you very much, Ray. Thank you very much, Christy, for inviting me back on uh, this week here. And again, like I said, you mentioned earlier, we've done a lot of webinars, thousands and thousands of DCs. And, and like you, Ray, you know, one thing I love about, you know, work alongside uh, Cairo Health is your desire to really help DCs. And that's really what we wanted to position ourselves is in this crisis situation, you know, tax credits, tax plan, all that good stuff, that's good and fine. But the reality is right now we're in a crisis. And I've talked to chiropractors, as you have, Ray, that are really in some desperate uh, circumstances. And we had a nice email that came from last week from our presentation with y'all that said, listen, this is a ray of hope. And that's really, we just want to be kind of like a lighthouse in these stormy seas that are, that are going on right now. So the information that, you know, that we're going to talk about today and, and uh, is, you know, I'm not going to rehash everything I covered last week. Uh, if you get a chance, go back and listen 
uh, to last week's presentation. I'm just going to give you the highlights of it. I'm also going to cover uh, a little bit about some changes. Now, the one thing about, as you probably can imagine, Ray, it's been like this here. We've been like on a boat and there's a target on another boat and we're trying to shoot at the target because they're changing everything. They changed the, on the 7B, which I'll talk about in a second, they changed the application process three times. They also, of course, just came out with all the changes for 7A, which I'm going to cover here today as well. And that just happened uh, yesterday, well, the night before, but we got the information out uh, yesterday morning. So this is all fresh. Uh, we believe this is the last change uh, that's going to happen uh, until they come out with a, a stimulus package, which I'll allude to a little bit later. So I did a podcast this morning for a group uh, that has exposure in a different, whole different uh, industry, uh, some good friends of mine. And, you know, some of the questions that kind of came up, the big one I hear over and over again is, you know, how do you prepare? Well, you've hit it right on the head. You know, working with DCs over the years, uh, I've had DCs who, you know, are very good uh, when it comes to keeping their expenses minimal. I can think of a DC up in New York. Uh, my, talk about efficient, probably one of the most efficient DCs I've ever met in my life. He keeps his expenses down in his practice and he's just a good steward. I mean, that's all there is to it. And our tendency, I think, when, when we look at things were going so well, I mean, we had a bull market for 10 years and, and things were, you know, kicking along and our practices were growing, we're expanding or even we're just maintaining. Then all this a sudden this hit is, you know, now we got to kind of tighten things up and look. And like you said, whether that's the, the, uh, the, the lunches or whether that's the laundry service, whatever, I think it's a real opportunity for us to reset. I mean, kind of look at our practices, even in our business here and say, okay, what's essential? Kind of like with this whole thing with the uh, COVID-19, you know, we have essential businesses and non-essential. So we have to determine what's essential in our life and what's non-essential. And I think that's uh, hitting it right on the head with the minimum expenses. I want to come back to um, the access to funds. So one of the things in 7A uh, that I don't believe I even covered last week was the whole issue of uh, IRAs and 401k. So the way the law stands right now is that you can access uh, your IRAs or 401ks. You can take a withdrawal out. So uh, historically, uh, and I've been doing this for a long, long 30 plus years, but uh, historically, if you took money out of an IRA uh, and you're under 59 and a half or out of a 401k, you took the withdrawal out, then you would have a 10% uh, a penalty for doing so. So what they've done now is they said, we're going to waive that. You don't have to worry about a penalty. Uh, you can take that money out. And then, of course, what they also did is they actually gave some really neat ways for you to, uh, well, let me back up. So when you generally take money out of an IRA, uh, it's all taxable in the year that you take it. So if you took, and this is up to $100,000 under this provision. So if you take $100,000 out of your IRA or 401k, it's all generally taxable in the year that you take it, which can pretty damaging when it comes to Uncle Sam getting his hand back in your pocketbook. But what they've done is they're going to allow you to def to take that uh, and, and defer that tax over a three-year period or split it up over three years. And then the second thing is historically you've always had to uh, repay it back within 60 days or it'll become a penalty and taxes and all that. Now they're giving you three years uh, to put it back up inside your IRA. Uh, you know, doing this as long as I have, the one thing I do know is that uh, I've never met anybody who said, man, I wish I would have uh, not saved so much money for retirement, but I've had a lot of people go the other direction, including DCs. And, you know, the reality is, um, you know, that money is set aside. Make sure that you can get it back up in there because you're going to need it someday. Maybe, God forbid, we have another type of coronavirus that we're dealing with today, but it's good to have that in the future uh, someday when you get to retirement. Uh, so that's number one. Number two, uh, the other provision in there was you can take loans against your 401k, or 403B, a little bit different guidelines. So you can take a loan out of your uh, 401k if you have it there. And uh, you can have a deferral of up to a year uh, to uh, start paying it back as far as the, the payment plan. Uh, you can access up to $100,000. It used to be capped out at $50,000. Now it's $100,000. So you can access that in your 401k. And you can take out up to 100% of the account balance. It used to be 50%. So I use this illustration often. Let's say, for example, if you had $150,000 in your 401k, you could now you can take out up 100% or $100,000, whichever is less. Or if you had $95,000, you can take all of it out as a loan. Uh, so the good thing is that they're given a lot of flexibility uh, for you to tap this cash, kind of like uh, what Ray was saying. Hey, Chris, if you don't mind, if you put that slide back up there, I want to make sure there was something else I wanted to cover. And you probably have it accessible easier than I do. 
And uh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Uh, there was one other thing on that particular. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, so again, advances, like you said, there's zero percent uh, credit cards out there. This thing I was gonna say, make sure that you're, you know, creative. If you go to bankrate.com, you can go on there and look for zero percent uh, 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 credit cards. You know, do transfers or whatever the case is, and, and it's just about creativity during this time. And these things are still available out there. And like Ray was saying, you know, this is just where we're going to have to reevaluate how we've handled things in the past and just going forward and doing things different differently. So back to 7A, I want to talk a little bit about that. That's the one that's in the news. That's the one that I want to really spend a, a lot of time on today. And that's 7A. That's the, the payroll protection program. And ultimately what that says in there, that they're going to help you in the payroll area. So uh, in a summary of what I covered last week, you're going to go back the last uh, 12 months. So generally you're looking at a rolling 12 months. So that'd be February 1 to January 31st, or uh, I've been told that they'll actually accept whatever happened in 2019 as that factor. So let's say, for example, your payroll uh, for your practice was a million dollars or a hundred thousand dollars, whatever that is, it's all your payroll. Now there's uh, one exception there. If you as a DC or your associates, or whatever the case is, have more than a hundred thousand uh, dollars that you take as income as W-2, uh, you only are able to count a hundred thousand. The other 50,000, 25, whatever it is, above that 100,000 factor uh, amount is not part of the factor. Um, you add all that up together and you divide it by 12. And that, that figure right there is your average monthly uh, wages and salaries. It does include, uh, you get people on 1099 or contractors, that's all included in there as well. You divide that by 12, that's gonna be your, fact, your, your number and you're gonna multiply it times 2.5. So again, in my illustration, uh, if you have, uh, let's say for example, a million dollars and you, and this is just easy numbers, so divided by 12, that's $83,000. Multiply that times 2.5, that's going to give you $208,000 of a loan. What they're trying to determine is your cap, because there's only $350 billion in this particular program. They're trying to spread it as much as they can. So they're looking at a two and a half month benefit uh, for those who apply. So you're going to take that 2.5 or 250% of whatever your average monthly, and that will be the cap. Now, what can you use that for? Now, this is extremely important, and I want everyone on here to really take note of this here. It's going to be important on what you use it for because that's going to determine what percentage of that loan you're going to be able to get forgiven. Uh, so what, and it's going to require documentations, a compliance uh, aspect of it, making sure that you have all your documentation to provide to the lending institution when it comes time to ask for forgiveness. Um, so you can use it for payroll costs. You can use it for health care benefits. You can use it for uh, even for retirement benefits. So if you're contributing to like a cash balance or a 401k is simple, that's part of the equation you can use it for. You can use it for your mortgage interest on your on your building, uh, not your not your principal, but your mortgage interest and as well as your rent and utilities and interest on debt incurred prior to February 15th of this year. So that's what you can use it for. Those are considered authorized um, expenses. Uh, keep in mind this, this, this loan, there, it's a non-recourse loan unless you use it for unauthorized purposes. So you can't use it for your school debt, uh, you know, to pay off your school loan, or I had one that had a balloon payment, I believe on his building. Those are things there that are not authorized. Uh, if you, meet all those criteria for the uh, forgiveness. Uh, so what they're gonna do, so the date that your loan is originated, so let's use April the 10th as, as an example. You have it originated April the 10th, and then of course they're gonna look at an eight week window. So April 10th to June 10th is what they're gonna be looking at. What do you use that for? Um, I will tell you, one thing we do with our clients is we set up a compliance process. Uh, and there's a lot more detail about it. I'll just kind of simplify it. I tell all my clients, that money comes in, you put it in a separate account. Do not commingle it with the rest of your uh, operations because you want it clean and concise. So when you go down to the banker to ask for forgiveness, you say, here's the account and here's the documentation that shows everything that was used for, that I'm, I'm meeting all those requirements for the forgiveness. Because like I, I tell my clients, I said, listen, if we can maximize your loan forgiveness. Let's say this illustration, let's say for example, you get a $100,000 loan 
And because of proper compliance, you get an extra $10,000 forgiven. That's $10,000 of free money, meaning that you don't have to pay it back. Um, and whatever, let me let me say this here, because this is, a, I think, is a cool benefit. So whatever you get is a loan. So let's use that 100000 as an illustration. That forgive, forgiveness of it or the loan in general is not taxable to you. So you don't have to worry about including that into your income uh, to pay taxes on. So let's say, for example, I have $100,000 of a loan uh, and then I have $100,000 of expenses. So that could be payroll and rent and different things that I covered earlier. So you don't show that $100,000 as income. The other, that $100,000 of uh, expenses that you use that money for, you still get to deduct that. So it's a tremendous, it's kind of like a, um, a double dipping. You get income you don't have to report and you get to use the expenses uh, as a, off on your taxes. So it helps you know save your taxes as well. So it's really kind of a neat, neat, neat feature there uh, from that standpoint. Uh, but so again, uh, on that hundred thousand dollars, if you can get an extra ten thousand uh, dollars through forgiveness, that's money in your pocket that you don't have to worry about paying back. But let's say, for example, you get a hundred thousand dollar loan, and because of how it's used, or um, you know, you use it's not used for the things that when I say how it's used for payroll and such, but if you use it for something other than what's allowed, uh, then of course, let's say it's only eighty percent that you get forgiven. That other twenty thousand, and this is what changed yesterday morning by the U.S. Treasury Department. That other twenty thousand dollars, you will have to uh, it'll, it'll be created into a, the a continuing of the loan. So they did change the guidelines on there. It was a ten up to a ten year pay uh, payback. They, they dropped that down to two years. So it's a two year payback, which seems a little harsh. But the reality is, as you hear the rest of these things, we do, they don't expect if you do proper compliance to have a whole lot of people with leftover money uh, that's not forgiven. Uh, but if you do, it's going to be two year payback. They lowered the interest rate. It was 4%. Now they dropped it down to a half a percent. And then the, the third thing is they give you a six month deferral of payments. So number one, you don't have to worry about making payments uh, for six months on that deferral uh, from the date of origination. It's going to be a half a percent uh, interest rate on that remaining amount. And then of course you have two years to pay it back. There is no prepayment penalties, so you don't have to worry about that. So if you want to, uh, you know, as, as things get back into proper order in your life and in your business and you're plugging along. Now, listen, I will tell you, if I'm looking at from a, as we look at the economics of here, if I have a loan at a half a percent that I can do over a two year period and or I could take, uh, you know, some of my capital that comes into the practice and pay off a higher interest uh, like a credit card or something to that degree you know it's all about using that wisdom that god has given us in making sure that we're uh, managing our cash flow the most efficient uh way uh, from an expense standpoint taxes and things such as that so that's the big changes uh, under 7a and and, and christy I, I i assume based on what ray told me what we can do is uh, on those specifics or if they have some other questions about 7a i'd be more than happy to field a few here and then i can talk a little bit more about uh, you know, some other things in 7A and, of course, 7B. So um, any any questions specifically you want to pose to me? Yes, I have a lot of them. <laughs> um, if you don't have a W-2, can it be based on taxable income as it is shown on your tax return? Yeah, great question. I hear that quite often. So if you're a sole proprietor or an LLC filing a Schedule C, it's going to be your net income. So, uh, of course, if you're your Schedule C and you deduct all your expenses, it's that amount down at the bottom. That's what you would use to determine that that uh, that factor. So, um, you know, where you divide it by 12 and give your average. I was talking to a DC uh, in that category, had $100,000, uh, $8,300 is what he's going to show. And so he's going to get about a $20,000 loan in his particular case. So... It, when they when they are asking for 2.5 times the payroll, it's not just the payroll for your staff. Do we need to include our rent and lease costs in that number as well? Yeah, it's strictly payroll, and that includes you as the DC uh, up to that hundred thousand dollar limit. But yeah, it's not that you don't include anything else, but just payroll. Um, and I've got several questions. I know we haven't gotten to this yet, but. Can you um, do both 7A and 7B? Yeah. Matter of fact, let me go ahead and address that. Uh, we had a DC uh, who's one of our clients say, hey, my banker said you can't do both. That banker is wrong uh, because we've already looked at the code. We know that you can. Now, what you can't do, and matter of fact, we tell everybody, apply for both. 
Uh, I'd rather you have it and not need it than need it and not have it. Because the, and, and I'll talk about some of the things that the NFIB put out, which was true historically, not so much today. Um, and I'm not here to contradict. I'm just saying this is just what we're finding out. But um, the, the thing about it is as long as you don't use that 7B, which is a working capital loan, for the same thing that you're taking claiming over on the 7A, you're going to be fine. So I would generally tell, advise my clients, listen, let's use your payroll and your, your mortgage interest if you need to and utilities and stuff over here. Everything else we put over here. Okay. Now, again, they're looking at forgiveness on that eight week window. So uh, the reality is, and I'll just kind of jump ahead of here on that 7B, historically, we, you know, we could get that money to you in about 30 days. Uh, right now, because of the influx, uh, because I'll tell you what kicked that off is that $10,000 comment. So under 7A, they get a provision that would flow it over to 7B. If you applied for 7B, they would allow you up to a $10,000, and I straight stress up to a $10,000 advance. Uh, well, first of all, uh, it, we don't know if it's going to be $10 or $10,000, depending upon uh, your application, that initial application. Um, but when you do that, that's, of course, um, you know, part of that provision. But everybody and their brother is trying to get that $10,000 because that's, quote, unquote, free money, even if you don't get approved for 7B. So there's been a huge, huge influx. So they're, what we've heard back from SBA is they're probably looking at six weeks before they, uh, at the soonest, and probably eight weeks before that money comes in. So that's why I told my clients, listen, let's get you on to 7A. Get that, that's going to be your, your fast money, as I call it, uh, in, the, in the case of this pyramid. And then 7B is going to be down there uh, in, in probably eight weeks out the, down the road, uh, hopefully not much longer than that. So we're looking at two months. This is going to carry you over and get you through uh, that two months because, again, that's an eight-week window, uh, that are actually two and a half months that they're trying to get you in uh, place there to kind of stabilize things. So... That would be my suggestion is you definitely want to apply for both. Uh, and like I said, if you get the loan over on 7B, you don't have to use it. Uh, because like I said earlier, if you, it's better to have it, not need it. And you can always turn it back and say, no, I don't need it. And, and again, our expectation, our prayer is that everyone get back on their feet, you know, in the next month or two. We just don't know how long it's going to take for the people to come out of their homes and say, yeah, I'm going to get back to normal. Fortunately, with chiropractic care, you know, pain's still there. They're still going to need that pain management. Um, so hopefully that will be happen quickly for our DCs out there. But in general, you know, people are going to be, I'm, I'm, I think I call it a little bit, um, uh, shell shock. You know, we've been so hammered and there's so much fear out there. You know, it's interesting. I went to the store the other day, uh, Ray and Christy, then it's, uh, or I'm taking, I went to get some dinner last night. I was up here to about midnight doing some recordings for some States and, um, went over here to this, this restaurant and they have red marks everywhere, every six feet. And so I get it, uh, you know, that's just for safety and protection. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, it's a very fearful situation out there these days. So anyways. Don, Don I have a couple of questions sure. that I'm reading. Um, and some of them are the very same questions I had asked you. So I, I, hopefully it'll be helpful to others. Absolutely. Uh, one, one of the uh, docs asked, if you have a, a, a locum tenens doc, meaning someone filling in for you, mm -hmm. or you have a uh, independent contractor doc, and they're a 1099 employee, can you include that amount as your payroll? As yes, you, payroll? yes, you can. So that's a great question. You absolutely can. And that's part of the list. If you look at last week's, well, that has it in there. So independent contractor. So again, if you have a DC coming in, uh, if you have an LMT, uh, who's a contract worker, uh, so those are still be included. Now, I would caution, let's say, for example, you have a, a DC who comes in and uh, whether they're a Schedule C, or whether they have their own S corporation and you're make that, I would caution them about trying to double dip, uh, meaning that you get the benefit, you're going to pay them, and then they're going to look for that help from the 7A program through their own. Now, you know, I had this on this podcast today, you know, a lot of these guys out there, they're not going to continue, they're, where they're getting their 1099s, this is real estate, they're, where they get their 1099s is not going to continue to pay them. So they rightfully could apply for it. Or let's say, for example, you get rid of one of those independent contractors, then they would have the ability to go themselves and apply for this uh, benefit as well. Got it. And as far as the, um, for example, we outsource our payroll, and so their processing fees that we have, um, are, can those be included as part of our payroll expense? 
you know, I don't see that in the code. That might be, uh, I don't believe so. I know everything else is when it comes to your payroll for the most part. Like I said, with retirement health care benefits, I've not heard anything or seen anything about those type of expenses uh, specifically. Um, but we can find out. That's actually a good question. All right. And let's see. There was another one here that really kind of hit home. Um, whenever you're calculating your your payroll expense, mm -hmm. should you just go off, say, take all of your W-2s that you sent out and use the gross amount? Or are we also able to include, you know, FICA, PUTA, state unemployment? Um, you mentioned the health insurance and the uh, any benefits that we might offer. Uh, but what about those taxes that I pay that are matching as an employer. Are those considered payroll expense? Before? Yeah, so great, great, great question. So um, yes and no. So let's kind of walk through this here. So you're still gonna be doing payroll uh, and all that, but the one part of that provision of 7A is the deferral of payroll taxes. So for the first quarter as it stands right now, we expect uh, as this continues down the road that they're gonna push it off into the second quarter to some degree. But they're gonna allow you to defer your payroll taxes, which is huge, meaning that, you know, uh, you do the withholding, you got your FICA, you got their FICA uh, that you're having to send off to the government. You're not going to have to do that. Uh, not right now. They're going to allow you to defer that. They're going to split it up over two years. So you're going to be able to push half of it. So let's say you, you have 50000 or let, let's say $20,000 in payroll taxes. I'm just trying to be uh, re, uh, conservative. So 10,000 of it would be due by December 31st of next year of 2021 by December 31st. And the other half would be due by December 31st of 2022. No interest and no penalties. Unheard okay. of. It's unprecedented, but it's, it's a good benefit. All right. But, but and, and that, that's good to know. But uh, maybe I'll phrase my question a little different. When I'm filling out the form for the PPP okay. loan, do I include FICA, FUTA, unemployment as part of my payroll expense that I'm going to multiply times 2.5. Yeah. It's just the gross wages. So it'd be your gross, gross amount. Wages. Yeah. Yes, sir. Got it. Okay. Sorry. I, I got a little ahead of there. No problem. We, we've got tons of other questions, but I know you want to cover these other couple of levels here or stair steps. So yeah, and, and I'm sure we'll have a little time at the end. We can come back and, and address any of these other questions. So let's talk about seven B, you know, as I mentioned before, um, that where I, I, I you know, when it comes to the information put out NFIB, that little sheet uh, Ray and I were looking at, and we'll provide, well, I think you've already done so, but we have one as well uh, with, uh, with the updated information. So uh, under 7B, that is a working capital loan. So 7A is done through a, a lending institution, a bank or, you know, some of the other groups out there. Um, uh, 7B is done directly to SBA. They have a, a site set up for, for COVID-19 uh, at uh, .sba.gov. And so it is designed specifically to address this issue. And it is going to be funded by the US Treasury. You don't go through a bank for this one here. Now, I think part of the confusion too is with the bankers is there's been a 7A program in, uh, around for a while, okay? Uh, but it's not the same one we're talking about today. This one specifically is a PPP. And that's where I think some of the, the conflict in their minds is you couldn't do both 7A and 7B under the old uh, guidelines. This is. Uh, totally new new rules, I guess the best way to put it. Uh, but some of the things that they have on there is that uh, three days. So uh, the three day thing that you hear about, it's not three days from the date you hit submit. It is three days from the date that the caseworker uh, reviews it. Okay. And that, that uh, I don't want to say approves it, but ultimately authorizes it. So it's three business days from that standpoint. What we don't know Oh, so when you go into seven into the SBA website, they have what they call initial application. And so what you're going to do is you're going to complete that information. Pretty basic, not too difficult. Uh, you're just in inputting information and then you're going to hit submit. That start gets you in the queue of, uh, of getting this process started. The reality is that's not the end. That's just the beginning. So um, the, the other part of that is there's going to be a lot of supporting documentation because this is treated just like a regular loan rate. It's, it's not like uh, the 7A where, you know, it, it's uh, been 
adjusted substantially. This one here still has a 640 credit or better. Uh, this is looking at you know having collateral. This is looking at all these different things. Well, they have to have all this documentation. Now, what they did do, based upon what we've seen so far, it used to be three years of tax returns, personal and corporate. Now they've dropped it down to only one year, which is extremely beneficial for us, for our clients that we work with, but also for those who are applying on their own, because that's that's a lot of stuff to get together. So all that being said is that uh, it, they've, they've loosened up a little bit, but it's still a, a full underwriting process. So let's say uh, you, you get that application in there, and let's say you get your grant. Let's say it's the whole $10,000. It, and like I said, that's going to be three days from once that caseworker reviews that and approves it. Then it's going to go into traditional underwriting. Right now, what we're hitting here, the pardon me, here not at SBA, is you're looking at uh, maybe six to eight weeks uh, for that process to to really run its course, just because of the demand. I mean, there's been there's over 10 million business owners out there all shooting for this. So I don't care if they're DCs or a restaurant down the street, everybody's going after this money. And so, you know, on the 7A, when I was talking about earlier, we talked to one of the lending institutions this morning, which is not a large one. They've got 7,500 applications in the queue. Uh, one of our DCs I talked to this morning in uh, Washington State said that uh, Wal uh, pardon me, Wells Fargo reached out to him and they said, listen, we're just getting the information now, we'll put you on the list. And so this can, you know, that whole process, just getting an appointment uh, is going to be very interesting and getting those processed. But they do have a, a fast track in place for those because they need to get that money into your hands. And I refer 7A is kind of like this. 7A is the adrenaline shot. So they have a, a, a syringe of adrenaline. They're trying to give a shot to your business because, you know, when I hear some of these DCs talking, I mean, there's a lot of despair out there. They just want to give you some juice for you and your employees, because like like uh, Ray was saying earlier, you know you got your patients looking for it at you for guidance and direction. You got your uh, employees who are looking to you as well to say, okay, am I going to have a job? Am I going to be laid off? Am I going to be you know half pay? Am I ever going to have a job back again? I had a DC in Oregon say, you know what, I've laid everybody off. I'm going to just go be. Uh, I'm not going to come back into business again. I'm just going to work for somebody. Well, you know, that, those are the type of things that are questions in the employer's minds. And of course, your family is coming to you as well. So, you know, that's that's the, the things we have to look at is when we're looking at this whole picture is making sure that we get all of our pieces in order. Now, going back to uh, so that eight weeks is, is going to be a process. So I would say the 7A is that gap is going to get you two and a half months. And then your uh, 7B is going to continue you on further. So anyway, that's what I just wanted to talk about that particular point in the uh, NFIB. Uh, what other questions you have, sir? All right. Um, let me scroll back up here. Well, and I, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier about the double dipping. Uh, so when you do the 7B, just make sure it's uh, applied for and used for things that's not co covered under the 7A, uh, because that's where the whole confusion, I think, is about the double dipping, is making sure that you're not using the same uh, other monies for the same expenses. So I have a question here. Can you do 7B and draw unemployment? Uh, the answer, as far as I know, would be yes, unless you're using it for payroll expenses, because the 7B specifically, and, and that grant even, can be used for payroll, payroll expenses or, or sick leave. So just be, I, I just, you know, if you're going to draw it and the purpose of that is for payroll, then again, that's a conversation going to go on with the loan officer to make sure that that's what it's used for. Okay, um, I have a question. What if I've already paid all my payroll taxes, the 941s? Is there a way to recoup that or just don't pay it for the next quarter or what, what would you advise? Yeah, that's that's actually a great question. I've not heard that, that one come up yet. I would say, quite frankly, you know, that, that you've already paid it. The likelihood of, you know, uh, getting that money back, um, you might want to check with your CPA and, and have them reach out to the IRS. I kind of doubt it, but who knows? I mean, they may say, yes, we'll let you get it back. It just to help you financially. It doesn't hurt to ask. And worst thing they could say is no. But I honestly believe, because we're really kind of in the, the midst of this. And as President Trump said the other day, they think that the it's going to peak somewhere around the end of this month. Well, that's a whole nother month into this quarter. And then just the trickle down process. So I would not be uh, surprised if they come back and say they're going to extend it to the second quarter. Now, of course, I can't guarantee that, but I think that's pro highly likely. Uh, the next question is, where do you apply for this 7A? Uh, I'm going through this myself, and 
But for that particular one, you do go to your local lenders that are set up as SBA lenders. And if you need that information, you can go to sba.gov to see a, a list of uh, 7A lenders. Um, yeah, and on that note, too, I'll just let you know that uh, we've developed a relationship with the second largest uh, uh, SBA lender in the country. Uh, and, and so we're trying to make it for those who want to utilize us. We can do a turnkey. Now, if you do use us, I'll just let you know this here. If you use another banker, well, that's fine. You know, we don't really care if you have someone specifically. We'll package everything up that they need because we'll already have it to do your 7B and we'll get it over to them. Uh, and then, of course, we'll assist in the compliance part. But, yeah, you go to your if you want to use your local bank, go right ahead. I've had some banks say they're not going to do this. And like Ray said, you want to make sure it, uh, that they're uh, enrolled into the program. Uh, and again, not all banks are your larger ones for the most part, I uh, expect to. Uh, but I talked to one up in Virginia the other day. They said, no, we're not going to do that. Uh, they just don't have the, the bandwidth to handle that much demand. The, the next question is, is the payroll protection program a first come first serve loan? My accountant has recommended I wait till next week for my size practice. I just don't want to miss the boat. Yeah. Well, the reality is even though that official start is tomorrow uh, it's going to probably take you that long just to get an appointment if you you know going through a lending institution uh, so i you know i'm not here to disagree with your accountant uh, it is a first come first serve basis i mean when that money is depleted theoretically it's going to be gone i expect the government will probably step in with some more like i said that through a stimulus package or something like that there but the good news is under this one here uh, they do have strict guidelines on how much you're going to get two and a half times your 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 average payroll. So they've got some limits there. Spread things out much much better than if you you know were just uh, like the seven B, where it can be up to two million dollars. Okay. This next question is interesting. Uh, for those of us that might have more than one business, uh, some docs may have their practice in a gym or a nutrition store or something like that. Are the PPP programs only applicable for what's considered essential businesses? or can non-essential businesses also apply and receive funds? Yeah, that is a terrific question. And I have two answers for that. Number one, it's all based upon tax ID numbers. So you, uh, again, if you have a, 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 a fitness center and it's under a separate entity and you have a separate tax return and tax ID number for, and then you have your chiropractic practice, you can apply for both entities because your employees are separate. Like with Ray, he's got his practice and he's got chiral health. Employees are under, under separate payrolls, separate tax ID numbers. And so that's how you'd apply. Yeah. So that's, go, I'm sorry. Yeah, th that was something that was confusing as I was going through some of the documents myself. You had to attest that you are not applying for the PPP um, more than once. And, but, but it didn't clarify that it is actually available per taxable entity. So yeah, if you have and, tax and, ID number for it and you've yeah. got payroll, then, then you absolutely can um, apply. Yeah, I think that that particular question, Ray, uh, is for, you know, you have partnerships where you have, you know, two D DCs or whatever, want to make sure they're both not applying for the same one, uh, which could, you know, theoretically could happen. And I think that they're trying to limit that. Um, so, yeah. Got it. All right. Um, there was a question. Uh, one, one of the attendees had already submitted their loan documents through SBA um, or was attempting to, but the website crashed. So they sent it in by mail. Um, they want to know if, if they should just try to keep reapplying on the website or hope that the mail delivers. Yeah. Well, I hope that when you sent it, you had uh, re you know, a signature required. Uh, if you, you should, again, depend on how long ago you sent it, because they did crash last week and, and people were sending in physical copies. There should have been some, uh, or you will get an email acknowledging the receipt. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I would necessarily go on there and apply again. Listen, the, the one thing about, as you can think about, all these applications coming in, uh, confusion in, in the governmental agencies when you got this application, this one here, I think that's just going to create more problems than it is good. Uh, so I definitely I'll wait to make sure you got some correspondence back uh, from that. This is an interesting question. It says, my practice is a PSC. I am an employee of the PSC. All employees, including myself, have applied for unemployment benefits. Mm -hmm. Can my office still apply for the SBA loan, 7A and B, to assist in the pay in the expense of other or 
excuse me, to assist in payment of other expenses. Does the application for unemployment disqualify my office for all or part of this loan? Yeah. So based upon what I've heard that that would not disqualify you, what they're trying to do is incentivize you to bring people back to work to get them off the unemployment payroll. I mean, the uh, rolls. Again, there are other expenses that it can be used for. Again, the mortgage interest, the utilities, the rent, the, the interest on uh, debt incurred prior to February 15th. Whatever is not forgiven is just going to be carried over as a note. So you, you're not harmed from that standpoint. They're just trying to give you some uh, motivation to bring people back on the payroll, number one, and provide those resources to do so. Okay. Uh, this is a, is a good one. It says, if my employees are already applying and filing for unemployment, am I eligible to file for the 7A or 7B? So the, <clears throat> I, I want to clarify something on this that, that I heard yesterday that um, if I have a staff member who is just fearful about going to work, but we have not shut down because we're an essential business, that they could not qualify for unemployment. You truly have to be terminated or relieved or put on furlough. So it can't just be, hey, I can make almost as much as I was while I was working. You truly have to be terminated from your employer or put on furlough to, to apply for that. So let's say that a doc does have a couple of employees that have just stepped away from the, the practice or in this case, all of them. Mm -hmm. Are they still able to apply for this? Because you got to assume that they'll be hiring people to replace them mm -hmm. or to you know kind of backfill. Yeah. Uh, so as long as they're using those funds, whether it be on the existing employees or new employees moving forward, they should be able to apply. Is that your take? Yeah, absolutely. And when it comes to the forgiveness, that's a good point, is that what they're looking at is called the FTE, okay, full-time equivalent employees. And so what they're looking at is what they call a headcount and the salary. So there's a headcount test and a salary test. And what that just determines, they don't care what body is fill, filling that position, whether that was Susie or Jane, it's ultimately that you have someone in there. Because again, you might have somebody who says, listen, I don't want to come back, you know, for whatever reason. And you find, you know, someone else to take that position. That's what they're looking for is under that testing is based upon headcount and salaries. Got it. Yeah. Good question though. All right, let's see. says, if I own the building and rent to my clinic, which is a separate company, am I able to use that rent as a forgivable expense? Yes, you absolutely can. Uh, and that's pretty common with the DCs who own their building. So let's say your rent is, you know, $5,000 a month, and that's what you have a history. So, and I'll explain that while I'm saying that in a second, but you have a history of paying that 5,000, then that can be used under that, that uh, triple P program. So I had one DC said, well, listen, you know, I haven't, this is just an accounting uh, uh, snafu. They should have done this a long time ago, but they don't show, they're not charging themselves rent is what they're not doing. And so what they've been doing is just paying the pay, uh, the property taxes and things like that there. Unfortunately, you kind of shortchange yourself under this scenario. Right. You can't go back and change it. And also you, you need to make sure that if you haven't already done so, even though you might show the track record, you're going to need a lease agreement that's dated prior to February 15th. Absolutely. You know, I, I was uh, listening in on a webinar uh, done by some of our friends, uh, Dr. Dave Nybauer and um, Larry Markson and, and se several others. And I really liked one of the things they said that you need to make a decision to come out of this better than when you went into it. Mm -hmm. And whether that's on your relationships, your finances, your just every your health exercise, um, and, you know, it, and I try to do a good job in keeping our numbers straight and that type of thing. But I will tell you, I, I have come across things like, oh, my gosh, that's going to hurt me because I didn't do it the proper way. So that was one of the questions that popped up earlier. A doc has his practice. He leases his building to the practice, but he never really put a, 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 an actual lease agreement in place. So, again, you know, part of this is a, is, is a learning lesson for all of us. Those are the kinds of things that we need to be thinking about for the future. Should something like this uh, ever happen again, just to kind of get our, our uh, financial house in order. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I had a conversation last year with the DC because we do uh, quarterly reviews of P and L's and balance sheet. And uh, I was almost taken back because he's in his fifties. He said, I've never looked at a P and L before. And unfortunately, you know, that's the case. But when you go to apply for these loans for the seven, a or seven B, 
you know, you're going to have to have all that documentation together. So, you know, again, sometimes we get so busy, maybe we don't slow down long enough to look, um, you know, because we just, you know, we're just making money. We're, we're, you know, like you said, you're taking care of payroll, you're, you're taking care of responsibilities, but it gives us an opportunity to look back and really look hard at your numbers. I have some DCs that are micromanage their numbers, which is fine. But overall, you know, there's a, we can reevaluate and say, okay, what can we do better with lease agreements? Make sure those in place, uh, listen on, on the, um, on the 7A, uh, you have to have articles of incorporation, operating agreement, things like that. And, and we had one DCI. I don't know where I get this stuff at. So, you know, it's all about having things in proper order. I think, like you said, it's going to get people reset or uh, uh, rebooted to have things run uh, maybe a little bit more efficiently and properly. Yeah. If, if you're on this call and you think PNL stands for pizza and linguine, you might want to call Don. <laughs> Just. Um, this is an interesting question for state associations that are nonprofit. Can they apply for the payroll protection? You can actually, I believe I, I received that email maybe yesterday. You can against 501 C three. Uh, so as long as you're nonprofit and you're operating a, a business there, it, it's, there's no, I mean, I have churches that doing it. So it, that it, it applies. This is a, a really interesting question. You said, I have a 10 month old practice with about 10,000 a month overhead and not profitable as of yet. Mm -hmm. Am I still el eligible to apply for any loan or money? Yeah, seven A specifically. Seven B, you're probably going to be because number one, your track record that you're still running in the red. They're going to be concerned about your ability to, to repay it. Uh, but seven A, that's not even uh, part of the equation. They're looking at payroll specifically. Th this is another one that um, came to me privately, not not on on this webinar, but um, unfortunately, there may be some docs. Um, that are behind on their taxes, their 941s, 940s, or maybe even personal taxes. Have you seen anything in these programs that would preclude someone that is in arrears to the IRS from being able to apply? Yeah, so I will tell you that if you don't have a sometime, uh, an agreement set up and that you're in a payment plan, it is going to create some challenges. Um, it's, that's even on school loans and stuff like that there. If you're owe money to the federal government and you don't have a, a payment plan in place, it is going to impair you from doing so. Uh, now, uh, when it comes to these, uh, the paycheck, the, the, I'm sorry, not the paycheck, but the rebate program where you're going to get the $2,400 if you're under, uh, if, uh, if you're married filing jointly, uh, that there in itself does not go towards that debt. That is going to come to you if you, again, there's a phase out and some things I'll cover here in a second. But that there is not does not go toward your your uh, debt, so you will get that money. All right, there is one other question here that, that I think is it may affect a lot of people. Uh, it says for S corps that take both a W two salary distribution and distribution, are the distributions eligible under the PPP or just the W two salary? And let me pause for a second before you answer that. Um, that's a situation that I am in as well, and. If you're looking at your salary, if it's over a hundred thousand dollars, it doesn't really matter what your distribution is. If your salary is already at a hundred, the most we can claim is a hundred thousand dollars. So uh, yeah. I'll let you give your two cents on that, Don. Yeah, absolutely. So it's all about your W two. So your K one on your S corporation is not included, and they're going to be looking at reasonable compensation. So um, and again, I would love to to be able to. Uh, get down to the details of this here. But one thing we look at when we look at DCs is, you know, what's your reasonable compensation? We're hoping that the IRS um, will base it upon what you're taking as W-2 wages, which is our assumption based upon every way. We didn't want to streamline this, so they're not going to get in deep in the weeds. But when you go over to 7B, they may uh, look at your, your compensation you're taking uh, differently. Uh, so I, I saw a DC, this has been last year, maybe two years ago, and he made three hundred forty thousand dollars a year, and he was taking thirty four thousand as a W two wage. Well, two things: you're right for an audit, and number two is right now. If you're in that scenario, you've just shot yourself in the foot um, because you just minimized how much you're going to be able to get in this loan. Got it. Okay, we'll pause the questions and, and let you get to the other segments. We're okay. kind of running up on on our uh, sure. timeline here. Yeah, so um, uh, while you're popping back over that screen here, I'll just take it real on the, uh, going back to the uh, the paycheck rebate program, it is $2,400 for married filing jointly. It's $1,200 uh, for a single. Now the criteria is $75,000 is for a single 
And if you hit $75,000 or less, you're going to get the full 1200 if you're single. If you're under 150000 married, filing jointly under 150, dollars you're going to get the full $2,400. Um, what will change is what they call the phase out. So from 150 to 198, it's going to phase out. And once you hit 198 of AGI, you're not going to get it. So it's $5 for every $100 above that, that floor, which is 150 all the way up to 198. And then it goes runs from 75 to 99 on the single. So just keep that in mind. Um, and also, if you have children that are qualified for the child tax credit on your normal tax return, you're going to get $500 per child. So that could be another almost $4,000 in your pocket, which maybe compared to normal is not a whole lot of money, but you know, $4,000 is $4,000. So just put that, uh, so that's, going to be, that's your employees, your patients, and yourself as well. Yeah. So Donna, is that something that they have to proactively apply for, or they're just going to get that based on their tax returns to the IRS? Yeah. So you don't have to do anything if you file taxes, then uh, in uh, 2019, they'll make sure see how you qualify based upon AGI. If you haven't filed 2019 personal, it's going to go to your 2018. And that's what they'll determine whether you're eligible uh, of how much. Okay. It looks like we've got about four minutes left. Uh, is, was there anything else you needed to, to touch on, Don? Yeah, I'll just real briefly about the, the tax credits, tax rebates. So once we get through this crisis, uh, the one thing that we do is we work with DCs around the country on identifying tax credits that they should have been able to take care, take an advantage of, but 99% of them have never done it because most CPAs are not familiar with it. Uh, and we get those back as rebates uh, that actually come back in checks to our DCs. We've seen as much as, or, or pardon me, as little as 15000 for that three-year period, as much as 150000 for that three-year period. But this is money that you're entitled to. But it takes, you know, once we go through the process and have our team look, review it, you're looking at probably about three months. So this would be kind of as his pyramid there. That would be the last thing. But, you know, once we get through the, the head of this crisis, we definitely want to take advantage of having analysis done because most DCs don't think they do research and development, uh, Ray, you know, and that every time you do a care plan, every time you do treatment, uh, but we get uh, research and development and also domestic production credits, uh, pretty significant. So well, I just want to put that bug in your ear that once we get sure. to this crisis, you know, feel free to reach out to us. We'll be more than happy to give you some direction on that. We actually did a webinar on there and I believe that's uh, probably up in the, the vault is, or whatever you all call it there. So, right. Yeah, and I would like to remind everybody on the call that the, the webinar that we did last week with Don, that is archived on our website, as well as several others. And um, Christy, you want to tell them a little bit about the webinar that's coming up uh, right after this? I would love to. So a lot of y'all are asking questions about employment law. Oh, wait, my camera's not on. Nope. There you go. Yeah. Hi. Um, so y'all, a lot of y'all are asking the questions about uh, our new responsibilities under FMLA, things that we have not had to address before um, if you had less than 500 employees. And so we actually have an employment um, law attorney who's going to be on our webinar that's on in one hour. Um, and she's going to be talking about um, specifically unemployment for the self-employed, because this is a new concept. So she's going to be answering those questions. Last week, she and her colleagues answered a lot of those FMLA questions. We still had over 100 questions that we did not get to in the live presentation. So next week, they're going to do um, a Q&A session um, to answer all of those questions that you have. So here's what we have coming up next. Erica Reb is going to be here talking about unemployment expansion. Next week, we are going to dig down into the nitty gritty of telehealth. And then we're going to do a follow up on last week's what employers need to know about the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Also, a lot of y'all are make sure you're going in there. When you click on more info, you're going to have to register, but it's going to take you right into the webinar webinar recording. And just under the chat box, you can download handouts and things like that. All right. Well, thanks so much, uh, Chrissy and Don. I appreciate you putting this together for us. And, um, you know, just leave you with one thought. This too shall pass. Y'all have a great day. Yes. Thank you very much.